Hey, how you doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Art of Making Things Happen, the podcast. And would you like to come to my party? That's a good question because I've just spoken with Nick Gray and you're going to be listening to this podcast. And he talks about how to throw a two-hour cocktail under the Nick concept, the N-I-C-K concept. This shit is really simple, but for some reason we're choosing not to use it. And I listened to his podcast. He threw a gauntlet down. And I'm running with it. So I love his concept on why we should be doing cocktail parties for, keyword, acquaintances. Not friends, acquaintances. Have I teased you enough? Listen to Nick Gray. He's got some sharp stuff, sharp stuff on how you can actually increase your relationship capital. Good. Enjoy it. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, I, I've... This is probably going to sound the weirdest introduction on the planet, but you wrote a book that should never exist. Um, it's true. It, and, but people are really sucking at relationships so far that you – it's a great book. I've read it. I endorse it. The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Big Relationships with Small Gatherings. Now – we always used to do that, and I don't want to sound like a grumpy old git going, oh, back in the days, but it was something that we used to do that we're very, very uncomfortable doing now. Why write the book, and then what's your challenge? Okay, as people get older, it gets harder to make new friends, and we forget that with intentionality, we can make new friends, number one. Number two, I think that I was just tired of going to bad parties. And so through hosting hundreds of cocktail parties in New York City and now teaching hundreds of people how to do it, I figured a formula, if you will, for a successful social gathering. I, I used that to launch my last business, by the way. That's how I, I did it was by hosting parties to make acquaintances. It's not just about the friends. It's your network of acquaintances. And then my challenge is I just want people to host a party to try it out for their friends and their neighbors and see how it could change their life. Now, you said as we get older, how old are you? Okay, I'm 40 years old, 4-0. All right, well, that's, that's fucking annoying for a start because you look about 32, all right? Okay, hey, so, I'll take it. <laughs> but do you think it's an age thing or do you think as a society we're getting bad at communicating? I think most people peak in their new friendships in university. They meet all these new people. They're, they're, these social collisions are happening in classes and parties. Then you get older, you just start to mellow out a little bit. You hang out with the same friends and you do the same thing again and again. And then let's be honest, the last couple of years haven't been easy for meeting new people. So we got some major headwinds. But that's probably kind of knocked us out of any kind of gain that we had. So anyone that was kind of like just getting good at uh, meeting up with people, because I talk a lot about communication, and I've often said I think we're getting really bad at it. COVID has amplified just how shit we are. Yeah. And I heard someone a while ago say that there was something called uh, a social hangover, where you had to suddenly talk to people now for the first time in two and a half years. You were going home going, whew. Home water, and it was a social hangover. So what do we need to do to first, before we go into the strategy of the book, why do we need these gatherings? Who gives a shit? Why do we need to do it? Why can't we go about our world checking everything out on Facebook and downloading Netflix till we're bored? So we found out about the best new business opportunities, customers, clients, jobs, and relationships, not through our best friends, but through our network of acquaintances, what sociologists call our weak ties or our loose connections, okay? And COVID, like you said, other things, as we get older, those loose connections, they're just not there. So many people, I can't tell you, have told me, oh, I found out about this great new job from this random LinkedIn connection. When you host parties, you'll develop and build your network of acquaintances, and big relationships can come out of those acquaintances. So so far, based on what I said, does that resonate with you? What do you think about that? I'm loving the way, and I want to draw attention to it, that you are not saying having a party with your friends. You are deliberately using the word acquaintances. Now, having your friend over to your house, hey, that's one thing. You grew up with them, you know them, you've shared blood, whatever. But acquaintances in your home. That's, yeah. got, that's got to make a lot of people pucker now. So how do you determine who's the right acquaintances and how do we start? 
So you can absolutely invite your friends to your party. They'll form what I call your core group. They're the first five people you invite to your party. They give you the confidence to invite those acquaintances. But the acquaintances, you're going to invite your, your, your neighbors, the people that maybe you see at the gym and you always say, oh, we should hang out sometime, but you never do. Your old work colleagues, random LinkedIn connections. These are the people who you want to invite to your parties because they're going to introduce you to other people. They'll see you around town. Oh my God, Steve hosts these awesome parties. You got to check this out. That's one of the biggest benefits people find when they start to host parties. They naturally get introduced to more and more people that come into their lives without any effort. Now I've had the fortune and I'm an antisocial person. I'll say that straight off the bat. And maybe it's because of my work and my business is so social that in my private life, in my private life, I'm very antisocial. But I've been invited to a few secret society dinners where we're not allowed to know who else is at the table and it's we're given a pseudonym or we're only allowed to use our middle name to introduce each other and we're not allowed to say... And these have actually been a little bit of hard work, but what I did notice was an after effect, which I hadn't noticed on the night. At the time, we weren't allowed to say what we did for a living, we had to speak as though it was our middle name and all of this effort going on. But a week later, I could remember absolutely everybody on that table. And there's people on that table that I've become very tight with because we shared that first uncomfortable moment. So I like that. how long have you been doing these parties? I love that party that you talked about, by the way. And I'm not saying those parties are bad. I'm simply saying it takes an advanced level of skill to host a party like that. It requires right. an experienced facilitator. And I could write a book like that, maybe, but I don't think a lot of people would do it. What I've found is the MVP, the minimum viable party, that anyone listening to this right now with zero hosting skills, when you follow this formula that I have, it can help you to host a good event. Should I talk about what happens at the parties? Yeah, I want to hear it, yeah. Think about my name, Nick, N-I-C-K. It's the Nick party formula. N stands for name tags. We all have name tags with our first name written in big letters. Look, name tags might feel awkward even for your friends and neighbors, but I'd rather feel awkward asking someone once to wear a name tag than all night feeling awkward for getting their name, okay? Name tags help for your other guests. Imagine your friend who comes and brings a new date to your party. Well, they don't know anybody at the party. It just makes everybody feel more welcome. Name tags are like a sports jersey. When you wear it, everyone's on the same team at the party. It's a safe place to meet new people. By the way, these parties, the perfect number, 15 to 20 people. That was going to be an important question. I, I was going to get to that. So 15 to 20 people. I'm going to come back and ask why. But do you want to answer that now or later? Let's do it now. Why? Why Less 15 to 20? Less than 15, there's not enough energy in the room. It's more work for you as a host. You have to babysit people. More than 20, and it just turns into chaos a little bit for first-time hosts. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Good answer. Carry on, please. So N stands for name tags. I stands for icebreakers. We'll do two and a half rounds of icebreakers at your party just to help break up the conversations. You ever been at a party and you get stuck talking to somebody? Yep. You're too nice to say, okay, I'm done here. Well, when you do icebreakers, not only does it help new conversations, it also helps end existing conversations. Ooh. So you do those icebreakers, say your name, say what you do for work, and tell me, you know, the, the third part we can get into, but then that's a, the third question. I have a various level, green, yellow, red level of icebreakers. The C stands for cocktails only, N-I-C-K. C is cocktails only. There's no dinner. Why no dinner? It's too much work, too much stress, and your ROI just isn't there. For a first-time host, keep it easy, keep it simple. N-I-C-K. K stands for kick them out at the end. It's only two hours long. That's it. That's the formula. When did you come up with this formula, and what aggravated you to start? I moved to New York City about 15 years ago, didn't know anybody, was not a social person, middle class, didn't have a lot of success at nightclubs or something like that. And I decided instead of going to these bad networking events, I would bring the party to me. I would start to host something with half people that I knew, you know, friends I'd met through town, maybe I had six of them, and half new people that I met. 
at the grocery, at the subway, at another event. Hey, come to my party. I mix people up, all these interesting people I meet. And that for me became a way through hosting hundreds of parties. I figured out this formula and then teaching it to people over the last five years. So first of all, why are people so bad at naturally? This is primitive stuff. Now, with respect, I'm loving the simplicity of the way you put it out there. I love the Nick concept, okay? But it ain't rocket science. Right, and it's so not rocket why, science. Why are people so blisteringly bad at it when you've just given them four ways that they can increase that, that circle, that sandpit, that friend group? Yeah. I think people are bad at it because here's exactly why I'll tell you. They try to be the cool host. Oh, I don't want to have name tags at my party. I just want everybody to be cool. They don't do icebreakers because, oh, that feels awkward. You know, I just want to be cool. I want to be chill. Okay. Now, what happens is they're lacking the generous leadership or authority to truly step up and be a host. Okay. When you become a host and lead your social gatherings, with that leadership and authority, you help your friends make new friends. And today, it's harder than ever to make a new friend. So that's what we need. That's why I'm encouraging these icebreakers, these name tags, adding a bit of structure. Frankly, people have forgotten how to make small talk a little bit. We're learning how to regather. The sociability is a muscle, and it takes work. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm so pleased and proud you actually brought up that last bit. We, we've, we've lost a lot of that strength in that muscle, and we need to revise it. We need to fine-tune it. Now, there's technology where you can communicate, whether it be Zoom, Tinder, Facebook, whatever. There's all these technologies for you to be able to, in air quotes, communicate with people. But why is it so imperative to actually get into a situation to meet new people? And do you ever get people turn you down because they're scared to come to your events? I think they definitely turn me down because they're scared, but they probably don't say they're scared. Oh, they have these reasons, excuses. Here's what I found. People with social anxiety, people that identify as um, introverts, they like to know what to expect. And yeah. by telling them, there'll be name tags, there'll be icebreakers, here's the guest list. I even have a secret weapon in the reminder messages. I include something called guest bios. It's a brief little blurb. It's a brief little blurb. Steve Sims hosts a podcast. Ask him about the podcast. Ask him about this crazy dinner he went to where they could only use their middle names. I include a little blurb about half or more of all the attendees that encourage new conversation ideas and it helps those introverts or those shy people to have the confidence to come and show up, actually. We see, by the way, for readers of my book, they're reporting over 93% attendance ratio for those who say that they're going to come and then actually come. So that's pretty good. That is good. That That is good. Now, you've also got, and we, we're in the month of me releasing my book, Go for Stupid, with stupid goals. You've got a big goal. What is your goal out of this book? My big goal is to help and get and talk to 500 people who've read my book and hosted a party. I think I'm up to 85 right now, which I don't know, maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot of people, each of them hosting parties for 15 to 20 people. I'm really proud of it. And that's, I've gotten to, yeah, yeah it's cool. I, I got all these photos on my website. I'll include a link in the show notes of people all across the world. Just had our first one in Africa, in Italy, had a couple in London now, several in Australia, in America, many in Canada. So it's neat. It's neat to see people gathering again at their homes, meeting their friends and neighbors. I think it's just helpful. It's what makes us people in all this BS about we're more divided than ever. When you just get and hang out with your neighbors, I think we're a lot more alike than we are dislike i don't want to wait till the end how is the best best way best place best platform for people to follow you uh i'm on um instagram i'm on twitter i'm at nick gray news there i gotta say though if you're someone who listens to this podcast you like listening i recorded the audiobook myself i spent six thousand dollars i rented out a whole studio i think i did a really good job so i'm proud of my audiobook for it oh good. and where can they find the book it's on Audible, on Apple Books, anywhere books are sold online, on Amazon, everything. And the name of the book? It's called The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Big Relationships with Small Gatherings. There's a big name tag on the front of the book. You'll know that's the right one. It's a blue one. 
as I say, I've got the book and I read it, and I really, I got the book and I, you, you get a book like that and you think, I don't need this help. Yes. And then you start reading it and you start going, this is simple stuff. Yeah. Why am I not doing it? Yeah, so, it's easy. It's not yeah. rocket science. It's easy. The best compliment I got is I is you can read this book in one sitting and you just come away from it and say, huh, even if I'm having a little kid's birthday party, I'm going to do name tags for the adults. Why? Because adults use the children as a social crutch to avoid talking and having adult interactions. Little things like that are just helpful as a reminder. So you're up to 80 some, 83, did you say? 83 parties have been thrown since the book? I, I've sold 5,900 you know, copies of the book, but I've heard from uh, 83 people who have okay. actually sent me an email. They've called me. They said, hey, I just hosted my party. I read your book. So that's the number that I'm tracking. I'm not, I don't care how many books I sell, how much money I make. It's not about that. It's how much actual difference can I make in the world, and I measure that by successful parties hosted. So 83 parties affecting 15 to 20 people, that's already a damn good number. I think it's good. It's not bad. It's not bad. 500 to me seems like a crazy goal. What's your new book? What is it called? Go for Stupid, The Art of Achieving Ridiculous Goals. See? See? Now, what feedback would you give me on that 500 number? I it think sounds- that's... I, I think it's a stupid goal, and that's why I love it. You're right. It sounds stupid to me. It sounds so like, how am I? I can't even get to 100. I'm going to get to 500. But because I got to think bigger, is that kind of what your book is about? That by setting these yes. big goals? Yeah, it's about getting people to kind of like go above their, their self imposed limitations. And I like the fact that you're actually creating impact. And I like, I'm urging anyone out there that's grabbing this book, and you should grab this book because you're probably crap at communicating. And I think I'm pretty good at it. But even in a few points in there, I was like, I'm not doing that. And that's so bloody easy. For argument's sake, the C, you know, just using the, the, the Nick algorithm there, the C for cocktails. I know when I've done a party, I've like, my God, I've got to get a chef in and I've got to get this and I've got to get the show ponies. I've overthought the bloody thing by just turning around and going, hang on a minute, sticking to two hours, and only doing cocktails, you're going to have dinner afterwards, you're going to have dinner beforehand, but I really like that concept. And when I saw that, I had never, ever, because you invite people over and you go, hey, it starts at eight. I don't think I've ever had a party where I've told them what time it finishes. Yes, right? You got to start an end time. It's so helpful. Here's why setting an end time helps. Number one, people show up on time. You ever host a party, say it starts at eight, nobody shows up till nine, or worse, the most awkward people show up right away and you're like, well, now what do I do? I, I got to babysit these people. And when you host a party, it's only two hours long. Everybody shows up on time. More people show up and attend. More people say yes, that they'll actually come. It's efficient. You get to go home. By the way, my parties are meant to only be hosted on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. Why those nights? They're not what I call red level days. They're not socially competitive where people are likely to have other things get scheduled. You don't want to compete with other people's parties. You want to make sure the number one indicator of a successful party is how many people showed up. If you get a room of 15 people, it's going to be success. If you have only three people, it'll be a failure. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and I like the fact that through your strategy, most people have ended up with a 93% return rate. So that's That's good. That that is very good. You say the red level. Do you have any other colored level um, on the days? I think red level is the most ones to be aware of. You know, my friend Steve hosted his first party, tried to do a New Year's Eve party. I said, Steve, how many other people are hosting New Year's Eve? It's so stressful. It's do not, please do not. I talked to somebody, said, oh, I want to use your thing for a Halloween party. I said, Halloween's on a Monday this year. No, this is too complicated. Please don't. Your first party should be easy, low stakes affair. Do not reach from the top shelf. Do not try to impress people with your first party. And here's why. The biggest benefits come when you learn to make hosting a habit. When it becomes something that you can do and do easily, you'll go through life collecting all of these acquaintances that come into your world. And they see you and refer people to come to your events when they know you run a good event. 
Now, that's a very powerful point that I don't think a lot of people pay attention to and most people are shit terrified of, and I know I am. Usually the person that doesn't get to enjoy the party is the host. So how do you make sure that the host is no longer an extra but a participant? Well, I'll tell you this. I, I don't know if I should even say it. I don't host parties to have fun myself. If I want to have fun, I'll go play tennis. I'll race go-karts. I'll go swimming. That's what I do to have fun. I think what you need to do is focus on adding value to your guests and your attendees. Focus on giving them a great party. And that means that you're acting as a bit of a referee. Don't host a party to have fun. If you want to do that, that's a different type of party. Your party, you need to be focused on helping all of your friends meet as many different people as they can, making introductions, mixing up the room, welcoming people, doing name tags. It's not going to be fun, but it can change your life. All right. And as you've already said, you know, you're there to make uh, you're there to make uh, relationships, which could lead into business, ideas, perspectives. So you're looking at building up your support system. And you say you're in New York. I remember, that's right, you said you're in New York, correct? Yeah, I used to live in New York. I moved to the great state of Texas now, but I was I, in New York for 13 years. And that's what was confusing me, because I saw your address and I, I saw your 917 phone number. So I was kind of like a bit thrown off. Um, when we watched the, the old sitcom Friends, which was the, 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 the New York Five, uh -huh. even back then in the 90s, people said to have five solid friends was quite an achievement. And I think today, you know, there's therapists and psychologists that are saying we're lucky if we have three. It's true. It's so true. are we getting bad at trusting people? And what level does social play in that distrust? You know who it's even worse for is for men. 15% of men say they don't have one single close friendship. Many adults say they haven't made a new friend in the last three years. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe we're more isolated than ever. We're spending more time. It's work from home. We're disconnected. It's harder to meet people. I don't have the answer to it. I'm just trying to think how I can help change it. I do like that. Have you come across John Levy? Yes, John Levy and the Influencers Dinners. I've attended many. He's a good friend. Yep, I've, uh, I've shared those dinners. That was the dinner that I was talking about. So, and John uh, does a great job. And John does a great job. But I don't think everybody can do what John does. And I wanted I, to write a book for everybody that could say, look, there's all these ideas about incredible parties. Maybe that's fine for a once a year event. What's the party that you can do every six weeks? And how can I make it easy for you? I'm obsessed with the MVP, minimum viable party. What's the easiest party, less than $100 in cost, two hours a time, where you can get 80% of the results with 20% of the work. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I know John and I couldn't throw his parties. And I love yours because of the simplicity. The quite simply got me thinking, I need to throw it. Because I don't know if you recall, but and I don't know how this happened. We didn't know each other. Someone sent me your book. And then someone pitched me uh, to actually have you on my podcast. And they, they went into all this long. And I'm like, who is this guy? And then I got to, I'm like, I've just read the book. Hell yes. So Yes. Uh, yeah, that's it was, amazing. It was funny how the world actually goes around. So I do endorse this book. I do challenge my people out there to be one of the next group he gets. You know, he's got 83. Let's get him up to 93. Let's get him up to 103. And let's help him towards his 500 goal. And selfishly, can you imagine what 500 parties in this format would do for us as a society? Isn't so, that nice? Nick, I love your goal. Again, where's the easiest place for people to get the book? Uh, find the book online, wherever books are sold on the internet. It's called The Two Hour Cocktail Party. I'll drop some links in the show notes about how to host a happy hour, how to plan a networking event, how to host a clothing swap. Women are loving these things. Ooh. All these ideas about how to plan events can be done with my formula. And the best thing is anyone can do it, really. It's not hard. Like Steve said, you don't even think you need this book. But there's some easy things. You can read the whole yeah. thing in an hour. And I've been jumping on the phone with people who read my book. It's what I'm working on for the next couple of years to try to get to that 500. And I love hearing people's questions. So reach out. Happy to brainstorm. 
Nick, thank you so much for being part of this show. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for showing up. I love your cause. I love your challenge. And I urge everyone to be part of his 500. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Steve. Hey, I hope you liked that episode of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast. And remember, these are done for you. If you like them, subscribe, share them around. But if you don't like them, send me an email to ask at stevedsims.com and you can tell me what I need to do to make this the most dynamic podcast you listen to. Anyway, make sure whatever you learned from the last podcast, you actually do something with. Without action, it's just a bunch of people blowing air. Have a good time. Until next time. Bye.